take a look at what I've got. This is quite an unusual processor, and today we're going to build a gaming PC worth just $350 around it. This computer will be able to run all modern games, including the new Stalker 2. At the end of the video, we'll also find out what happens to the CPU when you push the voltage to 1.7 volts. Let's start with the processor itself. This Frankenstein was crafted by the Chinese. It seems like they had a stockpile of broken laptops from which they salvaged mobile CPUs and learned how to adapt them for desktop computers. As you can see, it's clear where the mobile chip ends and where their modifications begin. The chip is soldered to the substrate, and it looks like it was done manually. The BGA balls, contacts, aren't exactly even. I bought this processor three months ago, and I still don't know if it even works. The cost of the processor was 45 bucks. On the top left corner, I'll keep track of the total cost of all PC components. The processor's codename is QQLT, which is visible on its lid. Speaking of the lid, it's homemade too, and these processors are often sold without one at all. The most interesting thing about this CPU is that it has an unlocked multiplier, meaning it can be overclocked. After a long search, I finally found a suitable and affordable motherboard for this CPU. It's the Asus Z170K with an LGA 1151 socket, which costs just 36 bucks. For those who may not know, the LGA 1151 one socket was released way back in 2015, meaning this platform is almost a decade old. However, the CPU itself isn't as old. Despite its age, this motherboard features three USB 3.1 ports, an M.2 slot for NVMe SSDs, and most importantly, a removable BIOS chip. This is crucial, and you'll understand why a bit later. I decided to buy new RAM because sellers on the secondary market charge way too much for used ones. To avoid saving just three to five bucks, I bought two G-Skill DDR4 modules, each with 16 gigabytes capacity. This is important because 16 gigabytes is no longer sufficient for modern games. The cost of the RAM was 60 bucks. We'll also need a programmer to reflash the BIOS of the motherboard so it can see our Frankenstein processor. The programmer costs just six bucks. Before proceeding, you'll need to reflash the motherboard. This might seem complicated at first, but it's actually much simpler than it appears. For this, you'll need another computer. First, remove the BIOS chip from the motherboard, insert it into the programmer, as shown in the video, and then connect the programmer to the other PC. Next, download the drivers for the programmer and the Coffee Time 0.99 program, which modifies the BIOS. I won't be showing the entire process in detail because this isn't a tutorial. Plus, there are plenty of videos online explaining how to do it. By the way, some Chinese sellers may include a pre-modified BIOS chip for your motherboard along with the CPU. After that, reinstall install the BIOS chip back into the motherboard. It's advisable to have a spare placeholder processor, like a Pentium, to check the PC's functionality before performing the BIOS modifications. I tested my PC with a standard CPU and everything worked fine. Now, you can try installing this processor into the socket. But that's not all. The seller included three small washers, ceiling rings, in the package. This is because the CPU vibrates quite a lot during operation. And to prevent the screws from loosening, you need to place these rings under them, which provide additional pressure on the screws. I also added a plastic washer under this screw to avoid damaging the board. Everything's ready. We install our mutant processor and close the lid. It looks as if this CPU was always meant to be here. The CPU has integrated graphics, so I connected the monitor directly to it. I turned on the PC, and it worked! Success! I waited three long months to see this image on the monitor, and it finally happened! Now, I can confidently assemble the rest of the PC. The remaining components are the SSD, graphics card, power supply, and case. The SSD is a Kingston 480 GB drive that I found secondhand for 24 bucks. The capacity isn't huge, but the only thing smaller than this is our budget. As for the graphics card, I chose, who would have guessed, the legendary RTX 2080 with blower style cooling. The price is fantastic. Just 170 bucks! For such a powerful graphics card, it's practically a steal, in my opinion. However, the previous owner mentioned that the card had never been serviced, so that's what I'm about to do. While I'm disassembling and cleaning the graphics card, let's talk about the budget for this build and potential alternatives. First, the most cost-effective option is if you already have a motherboard with an LGA 1151 socket and a low-end processor. You can sell it and even turn a profit. If you have 16GB of RAM, you could also sell it and purchase two 16GB modules 
or buy two additional 8GB modules. Either way, with this mutant, achieving high RAM frequencies isn't an option. The maximum you can aim for is about 2900 MHz, but no more. Another option is to build a system on a used AM4 socket. If you don't already have a motherboard for your processor, building on AM4 will be slightly more expensive, but the system will be more modern. Now, regarding the maintenance of used graphics cards within our budget range, for example, instead of the RTX 2080, you could go with an RTX 5700 XT, which I'm also servicing right now. The hotspot temperatures on this card reached 105 degrees, so I decided to replace the thermal paste. Apologies for the overly bright colors in the video. I believed in myself very much and tried using unconventional lighting, but I forgot to enable log mode on the camera. As a result, it's now impossible to properly calibrate the colors. As you can see, the thermal paste on the graphics card hasn't completely dried out yet. However, this doesn't mean it's good or doesn't need replacing. After servicing, you'll notice a significant temperature drop. As for the thermal pads, if they haven't dried out, I generally don't replace them at all. By the way, one big advantage of graphics cards with blower style cooling is that they're sometimes sold much cheaper than their fan based counterparts. They're more compact and, in terms of cooling efficiency, are almost as good. The downside is that selling them later at a good price can be challenging. Power supply! I estimated the cost of the power supply at $10, though I wasn't even planning to include it in the total cost build. After all, we're already building a PC from shit and sticks using secondhand components, and almost any power supply will do, even one that's 15 years old. Did it fail? No big deal. There's always another one to be found in the trash. This component is universal, like the case, and it doesn't affect FPS. And what doesn't affect FPS is where we save money. Case. For this build, I chose the best option, a banana box for 50 cents. It has no downsides, only advantages, starting with the price and ending with the flexibility it offers for component installation. Plus, the box has a decent design, and I really like bananas, so I have plenty of PC cases. Before installing the motherboard into this case, I decided to tweak its cooling a bit. During testing, it turned out that the power delivery system gets quite hot when overclocked. So I made the strategic decision to cut out a heatsink for the VRM zone. It's the same heatsink from a RAM module, and it seems like it was made for this purpose. I cut it to size and attached it with thermal tape, and then added a fan on top. Don't laugh. You have no idea how effective this solution is when you add proper airflow. Now the board is fully battle ready. I almost forgot about this crucial component. We'll also need a cooler capable of dissipating 130 watts. You can buy a used one for 5 to 10 bucks. I slightly exceeded the budget, but prices vary by country, so the total cost will still be around 350 bucks, give or take. Figuring out how to mount the motherboard in the case was a real challenge since custom solutions require custom actions. I marked and cut openings in the cardboard for the components. The hardest part was cutting a ventilation hole for the exhaust fan, which I later secured with zip ties. After some thought, I decided that the most practical solution was to secure the motherboard with zip ties at three points. The positioning of the ports depends on how we orient the case. However, a horizontal layout is preferable since the motherboard bends slightly under the weight of the cooler and graphics card, as if anyone else would even attempt something like this. Mounting the power supply was much trickier. I had to tap into my full scientific and technical potential to secure it reliably and effectively. The graphics card can be installed in two ways. If you want it outside, Inside the case, you can connect it via a fire hose. This way, you can warm your hands with the card's exhaust and monitor it for any potential issues like thermal throttling. Just look at this beauty! And the best part? This unique design costs mere pennies! I can hardly imagine what this beast is capable of. Let's find out! We've got a processor with 6 cores and 12 threads based on the Coffee Lake architecture. While the system doesn't accurately identify the exact model based on its specs, it's either the i7-9850H or its desktop equivalent, the i7-8700K. In its stock state, the processor is fairly sluggish, but even so, I'll show you what it can do in stock or two. On epic graphics setting, with the focus on CPU performance, we're getting 35 FPS in demanding scenes, like this one, and up to 60 FPS in open areas. Honestly, that's disappointing. The processor runs at a stock frequency of 4GHz, and the RAM operates at 2133MHz. To improve the situation, 
I dove into the BIOS and performed some overclocking. Unfortunately, I didn't get the most capable sample of the processor, so I only managed to increase the clock speed by 700 MHz. The RAM now runs at 2700 MHz. Overclocking results. Compared to stock performance, the boost is noticeable. The PC even opens programs faster now. Temperatures and power consumption. With the overclock, the CPU's power draw increased to 130 watts, but the temperatures remain within normal limits. Though I wouldn't push it any further. After overclocking, the FPS in the game increased by 10 frames in both the most demanding and the easiest scenes. This has a significant impact on the gaming experience. In intense moments, those extra 10 frames can determine whether you suffer from poor performance or enjoy smooth gameplay. The performance boost is roughly 25%, making the effort clearly worthwhile. The difference in FPS between minimum and epic settings is only 10 to 15 frames. However, the increase feels as impactful as the overclocking, making gameplay noticeably more comfortable. Now for the graphics card test. The RTX 2080 handles even epic settings at full HD. While it occasionally struggles in some scenes, it's hard to complain. I've played games at worse FPS, and this is without enabling frame generation. As you can see, the difference between the minimum and epic graphics presets is about 25 FPS in 1080p. If we consider weaker graphics cards like the RTX 580 with 4 gigabytes of VRAM, playing even at low settings or 720p is impossible. The reason is the insufficient video memory. The game requires at least 8 gigabytes even on low settings. The RTX 580 is headed for the trash bin. The RTX 5700 XT performs somewhat better. This card already has 8 gigabytes of VRAM and a chip that's twice as powerful. It's about 20 to 25 percent weaker than the RTX 2080, but still allows for comfortable gaming. In demanding scenes, you may notice some GPU underutilization due to the processor. This is on a Ryzen 7 2700 overclock to 4 GHz. However, no matter how much you overclock it, you'll still get a bottleneck. After replacing the thermal paste, the hotspot temperatures drop from 105 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius, so the disassembly wasn't in vain. Now, as promised, let's see what happens if we push our processor to the limit and find out just how far we can overclock it. To do this, I'll replace the cooling system with a more powerful one and gradually increase the voltage and clock speeds. Or maybe not. Let's just crank it up to the max right away. 1.7 volts. Well, it seems like the PC turned on, but now I'm seeing a message. CPU over voltage error. Let's head into the BIOS. In the BIOS, it shows 1.68 volts, but the system refuses to boot. Apparently, there is some kind of safety mechanism to protect against reckless users trying to fry their PC. I tried 1.6 volts and even slightly lower, but the PC wouldn't start until I set the voltage to 1.55 volts. At this voltage, the PC quickly overheated and froze. So it turns out you can't burn it out that easily. Thanks for watching, and see you next time!